Welcome back to the Alts Podcast. I'm your host, Horatio Ruiz. We bring you industry leaders and creators to give their insights on the rapidly changing and exciting world of alternative assets. Opinions expressed on this podcast by the host and podcast guests are for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Podcast hosts and guests may maintain positions in the offerings discussed in this podcast. Today's guests are co-founder and CEO Ryan Frazier of Arrived Homes and Vice President of Investment Cameron Wu. Arrived fractionalizes home ownership of single-family houses where investors can buy a share for as little as $100. Through Arrived, you get to earn passive income through rental payments and equity appreciation. Ryan and Cameron talk about the benefits of investing in real estate, the properties they own, and the systems in place for buying and maintaining great rental properties. Let's listen in. All right, so we're very happy today, very pleased uh, to have Ryan Frazier. He's the CEO and co-founder of Arrived Homes. And we also have Cameron Wu, the Vice President of Investments for Arrived Homes. And if you're not familiar with Arrived Homes, their model is fantastic. They are basically able to take properties, they fractionalize it, and investors are able to buy those shares so that they can gain income through rental properties, through dividends. Uh, And I'm really going to let Ryan take it away here. If someone were to ask you, Ryan, about what Arrived Homes is all about, what would you say it is? Yeah, it's really about making it as easy as possible for anyone who wants to invest in rental properties to be able to do so, to access the passive income and historical property appreciation that have delivered such consistent returns for for rental properties, but without any of the traditional work involved. And the way that Arrived works is really an investment platform where you buy shares of individual houses. So you get to browse like you're on Zillow, uh, but there's a button there where you can invest you know, any amount of money that you want in those individual homes and build a portfolio that way. And it truly becomes a passive investment at that point. And so really what we've tried to solve is making it easier for people to invest regardless of you know, the amount of money they want to invest in individual houses. You don't have to come up with a six-figure down payment. And you also don't need to worry about the time typically involved in, in managing property. Where did you guys get this idea to where you guys could, could fractionalize uh, homes that are being uh, rented out and then being able to you know have shares of those? What was like, kind of like your interest or your background in real estate Made you see that there was an opportunity there. I think that, you know, for my co-founders and I, uh, we kind of came at it from two different angles. Uh, with Kenny and I, uh, our CTO, we had really moved around a lot over the last ten years of, of our career, uh, building a previous business, and we had people in our lives that we saw be wildly successful owning property. But because we were moving every couple of years, we really didn't have the opportunity to invest, and so that started us thinking about what does the future of property investment look like and ownership of homes for people when they want that flexibility to be able to move? And that really, I think, led to the idea of Arrive where you could invest and buy shares of homes really across the country in whatever markets really resonate with you and really are seeing great growth, um, but without having to be in that region to to manage that property. And then our other co-founder, Alejandro, um, really had been thinking about home ownership from from a different angle, and how you know has really been really challenging to to access home ownership, uh, particularly for minorities in this uh, country. And you know, we really realized as we were brainstorming on the idea and figuring out you know this model that the solution for both was really the same, C- really creating access for anyone to invest, starting from a hundred dollars per house um, to up to you know twenty or twenty five thousand dollars per house kind of giving anyone who wants to invest access and access to, you know, home ownership, but also access to, you know, property investment and and everything that comes along with that. Yeah. You know, I, that message kind of resonates with me because when my wife and I were kind of saving up for, for a home, right, it, it felt like when we had finally reached that point that we had kind of made it, right, that we had accomplished something. And, um, you know, the home resembles, you know, it represents a lot of different things, right? You know, a place where you raise your family, a place where you create memories, but part of it is financial, right? It kind of, over the years, it's proven to be an asset that appreciates and that will kind of maybe give you some sort of return when it's time to retire. You know, you could sell your home and then go somewhere else and 
and, and use that money to live off of that for for into your retirement. So I I, I can definitely that definitely resonates. Um, do you feel like that uh, that opportunity that feeling of of success or achievement has has had like an, an impact on you? You know, in your personal lives or or in the you know the investors that you see investing in your platform. Yeah, I, I think it definitely has. I mean, I think we see a lot of different types of people investing through Arrived, people who are making their first investment into into property um, and really being that avenue to start building home equity or, or wealth through real estate. And then we have others who uh, maybe have had you know, owned a home before or even owned a, a rental property before, but want it to be more passive. They don't want to you know, have to be responsible or liable for debt or the tenants or dealing with a property manager are really the things that typically have come along with, with real estate investment. And you mentioned that, you know, part of this is just that, you know, these have been great investments over time. And I think the, the remarkable thing about rental properties is that it's just been so consistent. And I think that's because of the, the fact that you can, you can make uh, money in multiple ways. You get this, you know, consistent rental income that's providing a great, you know, dividend or yield. And, and right now, arrived properties are averaging around 6% dividend yields per year. And then you also have, you know, great historical appreciation, where over the last 20 years, you know, rental properties have, have outperformed the S&P 500 consistently over that period, delivering, I think, about 11.7% annualized returns versus 9.5% for the S&P 500. And so I think that combination of you know great returns and that consistency, but also the fact that it's a tangible asset that that a lot of people really want uh, want to own. Uh, I'm looking at the website right now, and uh, you guys have managed to put 68 homes under your portfolio. I'm seeing here that 65 have sold out, and there's three for sale still, still still being kind of funded. When you started, right? Was it typical you started with one property? Um, how did you build up the the business and, and how have you gone about expanding into 68 homes? Well, that's been Cameron on his end. Cameron, I'll let you jump in on on the the real estate you've been acquiring and, and more of our model in terms of how we've thought about markets. Yeah, and a, a little quick background. So I've been involved in real estate investing for pretty much my entire life. My family, they are real estate investors, very entrepreneurial. So from a very young age, I got to see a lot of different facets of the real estate and business. And it's not pretty, <laughs> to say the least. There's a lot of work involved. And that's why I'm so excited about Arrived is because I think this business really solves a big problem. It's not vaporware. It's not just kind of shuffling papers as an idea. There's a lot of really big hurdles to real estate. Capital, time, experience, they're all very real. So even if you have the capital, a lot of time people don't have the time or the experience. Or, you know, you could have two out of the uh, three legs of the bar stool, but unless you have all three, it's pretty tough to get into real estate investments. And I grew up seeing that firsthand. And then I worked for the last seven years in uh, institutional single family residential real estate doing pricing and asset management with American Homes for Rent. So they're the second largest single family landlord in the country. So I got to really get a lot of great experience seeing the operating model at ground zero and really the birth of the industry, I would say, as far as institutional investment within the single family asset class goes. So it was a really great opportunity to meet uh, Ryan, Kenny and Alejandro uh, back when everything was getting started. And, you know, to talk more about the assets, when I joined, uh, we were in one market. We were in Northwest Arkansas, Fayetteville, Bentonville area, uh, where Walmart and the University of Arkansas is. And we had this model where we were acquiring homes there. And we thought, well, you know, these are great homes, but people want to diversify across the country. And, and part of the value proposition of what we're offering is access, not just to, you know, a couple homes in Northwest Arkansas or even a lot of homes there, but really across the asset class across the country. So we made kind of a, a hard pivot in thinking about the asset model instead of really specializing in a couple markets and getting scale there like the single family operators have traditionally done and started thinking about how do we orchestrate a business model where we can get the best investments across the best cities and do it quickly. Because if you're an owner on our platform, it's great to have a couple homes in Arkansas, but then you realize, well, I've got a lot of money in Arkansas. Maybe I want to put it in somewhere else, a different part of the country to get exposed to a different set of underlying economics. So that was kind of the aha moment for us when we were talking about it. And very quickly, we made the decision to start expanding out. So within a couple months, we started um, buying in four or five additional states. So we expanded out into some great markets in the Carolinas, both North and South Carolina. 
Um, but we always had the idea that we were going to keep a really consistent model. I think part of the asset strategy is to invest in high quality assets that are much more passive in nature and can give investors peace of mind. So we started zeroing in on newer assets, newer builds, um, and even new builds themselves, um, as we're looking to add inventory uh, and partner with builders. So we started buying these really great homes um, across all the cities, uh, having to also form the infrastructure to manage the properties, find brokers on the acquisition side of things, and partner with a lot of third-party services to really help orchestrate the entire logistics involved in uh, squeezing out the cash flow. So uh, we then moved to Denver, Phoenix, Colorado Springs, and just started implementing this game plan where we were planting flags all over the country. Uh, really create this network where we had strong partners in uh, all the regions that we operated in so we could get the best investments, retain flexibility, and um, really not be beholden to any one particular geography. That's one of the things I noticed with a lot of the larger institutional players is that you know they really needed scale, so they were super exposed to the underlying performance of that market. So you know, they were going to be in there for the long haul and they would need to uh, identify a lot of homes, scale up, take on full-time employees. Um, and it was just a riskier business plan in my mind. So, you know, for us, knowing what our product market fit would be, we decided that the, the best plan would be to open up a lot of cities um, in different markets, find the best assets in there, and then develop the, the infrastructure layer to be able to operate them really well. And I think so far, it's been resonating very well with our customers. When we open up new markets, I mean, they sell out pretty quickly. So definitely the appetite to expand into different areas is, is out there. So two questions there. What goes into your metrics, right? You have certain metrics, maybe you have certain uh, data that you're looking at. What constitutes a, a, a good geographic area to expand into, right? In, in terms of real estate, what is it you're looking for? You know, are you looking college towns, strong employment numbers. I'm just rattling things off. What exactly is it that you're looking for? And then the second thing is, what are the homes that you're looking for? What characteristics do those homes have that you're acquiring? Yeah, for the markets, I think that in the longer term, Arrived is going to be in every top 100 MSA in the country, and even some uh, more specialty ones, such as resort towns or areas that are very conducive to short-term rentals. So even if they're not very large from a population point of view, they may be highly desirable, a little bit more niche, uh, but nonetheless, great a great investment. And if we're thinking about core characteristics, you, you certainly rattled off a couple of them um, as far as having really strong fundamental economics and job growth. I think that's probably the, the, the most core thing that drives population growth, but that is a little bit less of an observable metric than population growth. So we are focused very much on what are the um, larger cities today that are underserved with rentals and where's the future growth? So a good example of a market that we're getting into um, that I don't think the institutional competition has quite found yet is Huntsville, Alabama. It's somewhere around the 115th largest MSA in the country, but in terms of decade over decade growth, it's like one of the top 10 or 15 fastest growing MSAs in, in the country. It's got a really strong fundamental economy, business friendly practices, and it's seen like 23% population growth just in 10 years compared to the average of around 9% across the country. So, you know, it's an area that is growing a lot. And with population growth comes the need for housing. Um, so certainly we look at population growth and uh, job growth. And then we also like to see some areas, um, and it may not pertain to all, but those that are supply constrained, sometimes there's uh, certain areas that are a little bit difficult to build and to, to add in inventory. So a place like Denver comes to mind. One, it's a highly desirable place to live. There's a young millennial population there, highly educated, good jobs. The nature of COVID has made a lot more of uh, that type of work remote. So people are driving towards um, desirable place, places to live, just like Denver is. So when supply is difficult to add to the market, it's like it's kind of what we like to see from an investment point of view because you know the earlier that we get in and we know that the core thesis is there as far as being desirable then you know the better the prospect is of home price appreciation so we certainly like that we look at both the demand side driven by um, jobs and population growth as well as supply constraints that exist because of either it's difficult to build from a geography point of view or from a regulatory point of view 
In terms of houses, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier that we gravitate towards newer homes for a, a more passive experience, less surprises on the expense side of things. So if we buy in newer homes and our average home, you know, year built is around 2017, there's going to be a lot less surprises in terms of infrastructure that needs to get replaced. HVACs, um, you know, they still got plenty of life on them. The roofs are still good. The bones are just generally all there. So there's not going to be um, nearly as many nasty expense surprises during the lifetime of the asset. We also invest in the path of progress. You know, it's one thing to invest where it has been hot um, and there's already been a lot of price appreciation, but you know, we're trying to invest in places that are not expensive right now, but will be expensive in five to seven years. So that path of progress, kind of looking where where's the freeway system going, where are the populations moving to? It may have been a little bit more sparse or rural in the past, but now, you know, it is going to be the area that consolidates the population. So that's generally what we're looking for is a newer asset, one that is um, desirable for you know, households to live in. Uh, we make capital improvements like putting in fences if there aren't there because we know that our tenants, you know, they have pets, they have families with young children. So we're trying to make the asset um, conducive to that type of household. So, you know, that's generally what we're looking for. But I would say the most important thing is just picking the right area and being in that path of progress and minimizing the expense risk over the life of the asset. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you mentioned a lot about like demographic changes, population shifts, and, and that stuff is fascinating. And, um, you know, maybe it's something that's not something that you would think about immediately when you're talking about real estate. But what are some of those markets? Um, and I could just kind of, this is, I've kind of been a, slightly obsessed because since COVID hit, the number of friends in, that have left uh, New York State, I'm in New York State, that have left to go to Texas is remarkable. And I'm like, there must be something going on in Texas. And I, I know you guys don't have any markets there. I don't know if you could talk about that offhand. Like, we must know about you know um, fifteen to twenty different families that just decided to up and leave New York and and, uh, and go to go to Texas. And I, I was wondering if you could if that's something that that is happening in that in the real estate scene. Uh, you know, in terms of that shift happening. Yeah, definitely. I think that again, the nature of COVID and and what it's done to accelerate different uh, workplace practices has really started this great migratory shift and you know shifting around. So. Even if the population were to stay the same as as our world changes, there's definitely going to be beneficiaries of these you know kind of n- new norms. So I think Texas uh, is a great example of that. It's got a very strong fundamental economy. I think Texas has three of the top ten largest MSAs in the country uh, between Houston, Dallas, and uh, San Antonio. Was in there, it may have dropped a little bit, but nonetheless, you know, very large population centers. It's got no state income tax, and with remote work really being a thing now. Uh, I'm sure many of the professionals in New York State who maybe are tired of the brutal you know, winter blizzards, three layers of taxation if you live in Manhattan, you know, all, all those things that it's hard to save, you know, it's got a high cost of living. So Texas and Florida as well, you know, Florida has been the beneficiary of, of, you know, the post pandemic world. People like the weather kind of year round. You got to deal with the hurricanes, but you know, that's a, that's a higher insurance cost, but otherwise you get sunny, wet weather for uh, the entire year and no state income tax. So I think that a lot of these places that don't have state income tax are certainly going to be beneficiaries of that remote work world. But anecdotally, you know, I lived in Las Vegas and the biggest driver of our growth was people fleeing California for very similar reasons. A little bit difficult to leave the nice weather and, kind of that California lifestyle. But, you know, it's it's tough living in LA. My dad's side of the family lives in LA and um, it's it's crowded. There's a lot of traffic, um, beautiful weather. But, you know, at, at some point, the cost of living and just everything in its totality, it, it, it wears down on you. So a lot of people loved going to Las Vegas. And again, Nevada, no state income tax, low cost of living. And with remote work being a, a normal practice now, it's just so much more doable for everyone. So I think that there's certainly a lot of consolidation around places that um, have these characteristics that are you know, certainly desirable. And you don't have to be at the epicenter anymore of those tier one cities, those top five cities to kind of live your life and have the profession that you may have gone there for in the beginning. So th- that's a lot of the shuffling around that we're seeing. And we're investing in a lot of those markets that are those beneficiaries. I think 
a lot of the Southeast is going to continue to benefit from migration out of um, um, denser populations in the Northeast. So maybe Boston, New York, New Jersey, a lot of people are moving to Charlotte, to Florida, to Atlanta. I mean, those places are exploding. So I think that's where you do want to be for um, the future going forward. And it's not to say that uh, go along these areas in short New York or short San Francisco, but you know certainly as a real estate company who you know we're trying to get people into great investments. That's certainly where we're looking. Absolutely, yeah. And 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 like you mentioned, the prices of certain home, you know, in certain cities, um, you know, the rents are just have just exploded, right? Uh, and it just becomes so hard to live in them. So definitely, what do people do? They're going to look for alternatives and 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 good alternatives at that. So when you decide, you know, you go into a region, you, you you're looking at newer homes. Are you guys buying these homes like under under the your title right i mean they are arrived homes incorporated um i'm just making that up and then who's kind of there in case something does go wrong like you know plumbing or an issue or roofing issue who's there to kind of take care of of the homes if, if they need some work here and there yeah great great question so very high level the way that we structure our investments is this uh, arrived holdings and you got it exactly right arrived holdings incorporated we purchase the properties. And during the escrow period, we assign those contracts to the entity that will be the investment vehicle um, that when you go onto our website and buy a share of, you know, Main Street Home, you're buying a share of the company that owns Main Street Home. So that is uh, one of the LLCs within our SEC offering, uh, a series LLC company called Arrived Homes LLC. So, Every property is put into its individual company and you are a shareholder of that company receiving the full economic pass through. The agreement is also structured, though, that Arrived Holdings is the manager of that company and the property and makes decisions in the best interest of the uh, stakeholders of that company. So when there is an issue with the underlying property, then we take care of that. Uh, we contract with property management companies to be the boots on the ground for the operations for the home and the tenant and making sure that the terms of the lease are abided by. And we're also doing the asset management to make sure that the best economic performance is being achieved uh, by that asset. So that's where we are making decisions to put in the fences, which kind of capital improvements to make and how to address maintenance. So to the extent that there is an issue that happens, we are managing the remediation of it as well as fighting for the best interests of our investors in those assets. Um, we carry full insurance on all of our homes, just like you would um, for your own residence or for your own investment home. So it's, it's very, very close and probably the closest thing that you can get to direct ownership of the property itself. And it really is, in fact, direct ownership of the property because you're just going through a company to, to do so. But everything else is exactly the same. So we professionally manage all of those aspects. Um, handle the risk management, handle the financing, handle all of the administration, as well as the actual um, coordination of the property management resources. What has been the, the, the most difficult part, in, you know, in your opinion, in, in building this portfolio of homes? You know, because a lot of times people have, have an idea or they balk at this idea of becoming a, a landlord, right? And renting out their property and getting income that way. A lot of times it's, you know, the maintenance. Sometimes it's, you know, not finding, you know, reliable tenants. Is that something that, that, as an investor, people don't even see or have to worry about because you kind of take care of that on, 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 the, on the front end. But in any case, what would, what would you say has been maybe something that's been a little bit tougher than you maybe anticipated? So first, it's it's definitely a good time to be in the real estate business as there's extremely high demand and assets are performing well. Rents are, are great. Um, and we have a very empowered tenant who has a lot of money to, um, you know, spend on rent and get high quality housing. I, th I think that investors may not realize, and if you haven't done real estate on your own before, how many moving parts there are in trying to operate real estate, much less in the context of a fractionalized investment that Arrived offers, because we also have the added complexity of qualifying securities with the SEC and dealing with 50 different secretary of states and all their LLCs and all the different insurance. So orchestrating it is definitely a big operation behind the scenes, as, as well as getting the right properties, finding the tenants. There's just so many moving pieces. So I think that the the toughest thing has been 
trying to take a playbook that um, is inherently complex already and build a system for that that can support every state in the nation because that's where we want to be. So being forward thinking about how we can scale this, you know, from one state to 50 states and from one market in Northwest Arkansas to 100 MSAs across the country, pre-planning that has been really tough. You know, there's, there's financing and a lot of states have different financing laws. There's insurance and, you know, good luck trying to get home insurance in Florida and, you know, not get beat up on the cost. There's just a lot of tough components where every state and every operating jurisdiction has these slight nuances that make it difficult to create an entire, you know, uniform experience. So I, I would say that, you know, a lot of it is behind the scenes, the, the complexity of doing all this. But, you know, that's really the goal of what we're trying to do is that you as an investor, you're going to be able to invest um, all over the country with a very uniform experience and um, a certain measure of quality control that we're working really hard behind the scenes to to create. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I know a lot of the the fractional companies, you know, you're, you're, you are providing a product, right? And, and people, let's say, you are buying into a property in this instance, right? But people don't really understand so what they're doing is they're buying, um, you know, a security. And, and then and what that entails, um, you know, that like you said, that buying a security of a property requires so much work, you know, <laughs> so I'm sure there's a lot going on behind the scenes, regulatory stuff, uh, getting involved with different laws. I want to talk about the investors, right? So I want to invest in arrived homes. And you guys have these these properties listed on your website. How much can I put in? Is there a limit to how much I can put in? And do you guys have like a required holding period for um, a return on investment in terms of like getting that initial investment back? Yeah. So for anyone who who wants to invest, you can you can visit our website. It's just arrivedhomes.com. And when you get there, the product experience is you know, imagine Zillow, but with a buy shares button on each property page. And really what that allows clients to do is browse individual houses. So you're picking and choosing which homes you want to invest in, and you can build a portfolio of homes across the country. And these are properties that have been you know, vetted by Cameron's team and gone through our underwriting process uh, before we've brought them into the platform. And then once you do invest, we take care of all of the work behind the scenes. I will say that you know, in terms of your question of uh, once you invest, how should you think about the length of time of the investment? And we really think of at least a five to seven year investment period for every investment. And we're really encouraging clients to think about investments over the long term, because that is what worked really well for real estate in the past. And in that time allows for compounding of these great consistent dividends and also for property appreciation. But we also know that you know clients may want to get liquidity earlier than that. And so through this offering process with the SEC, we're basically creating a public offering for the security that owns the house. And so that means that investors can get liquidity earlier if they would like to as well. And we're working on a, a redemption program right now to basically allow Arrive to help create that liquidity uh, periodically throughout the year. And that should be ready over the next couple of months where we're registering that. Um, in the next few weeks. And then over time, we'll continue to add more forms of liquidity um, to allow you know, clients to, to buy and sell from each other. And, and then you know, in that way, you know, really investors can, can build portfolios based on properties that have already pre-sold in, in the market. And I think that's really unique is thinking about, um, you know, both combining the great aspects of, of investing in, in rental homes that have been these great consistent rates of return over time, but also with liquidity and the ability to get, you know, fractional liquidity where you don't have to sell all of your position. You could get partial liquidity as well. Wow. So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that, like, in terms of creating that liquidity, there's going to be a, an option, a redemption program where maybe you're the, the initial investors may be dealing with the parent company and you know trading in their shares and, and maybe, I guess buying from Arrived. But then you're, the second other option might be having the secondary market, right, where the investors can trade with each other between markets, between homes, whatever the, the situation might arise. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So we're, we're registering that redemption program right now where Arrive will basically facilitate um, that liquidity program. And that's really as we build up our investor base, we want to give folks access to be able to get liquidity earlier when they want it. 
But over time, our investor base is growing really, really quickly. And so we know that really there'll be enough, you know, in terms of size and scale of this investor base to facilitate a more fulsome secondary market. And at that point, you know, Arrive's redemption program likely becomes more of a, a floor price is probably a way to think about it at that point in time in the future. Uh, but for now, it's really about just creating that option to kind of facilitate that, that liquidity here in the short term. Um, so yeah, those are both things that we're working on right now and, and plan to launch. Could you talk about also um, when someone invests, are, are there any um, fees that they might have to put up front uh, for, for anything uh, just you know, for, to get into processing fees maybe, or are there additional fees that kind of go into the maintenance of a property or anything like that? Sure. We disclose all of the fees on each property page. And once a, a client invests and picks a dollar amount to invest, the fees are included you know, in that investment amount. So that's the only amount of money that anyone should ever expect to come out of pocket. So there's no future kind of unplanned expenses if there's a, a maintenance expense or a vacancy period or to cover you know, arrives cost. Our fee structure is you know, one, we're, we're taking a fee, an, a sourcing fee, which you'll see on our property pages, really for facilitating the, the real estate transaction. And it's about three and a half percent of the purchase price of the property. So sort of our role in, in putting the deal together um, and securitizing that deal and, and creating the kind of property entity. And then over time, uh, we also earn 1% of the equity that's invested per year, sort of a standardized asset management fee. And that's really the, the fee structure for Arrive for clients. That future asset management fee um, comes out of you know, rent, future rental income. And so the dividend yields that we're seeing uh, right now, you know, around 5 to 7% uh, per year are after you know, net of any of our fees. So that's that's kind of how the fee structure works for arrived. So then, as an investor, whenever uh, you're getting that rent back, right? Those are the dividends you're getting. You're getting um, income that way, and then you can also get income, say, once the property is is bought by a, another homeowner or another company. Whatever the the you know the difference between the appreciation of the home and, and what it was sold for. Correct. Yeah, you have those great two ways to make money. You get the dividends, and today we pay them out quarterly. And really, that's the rental income minus any of the operating expenses, the interest on the loan, and any other fees. And that get paid is what gets paid out as a dividend. And then you're also getting and benefiting from any of the property appreciation. And that property appreciation essentially accrues to the, the share price over time. That, that's how it materializes. And so whether the property is sold a few years down the line during that investment period, or you decide to sell shares, that's how you get access to the, you know, any of the property appreciation side. And those two components um, really you know, drive a lot of the returns for, for investing in rental properties. And just in terms of you know, what that looks like over the long term, uh, historically over the last 20 years, what we found is that rental properties on average are, are generating about an 11.7% annual rate of return between, you know, on those two sources of, of uh, income combined. And that kind of shows, you know, this is what has happened historically in, in rental properties. Um, and I think that consistency and the two ways to kind of earn a, a return is, is what has driven a lot of interest, frankly, in, in owning the asset. Yeah, you mentioned before that you know real estate is like that old reliable, right? And in the last couple of years, the number of fractional markets uh, exploding, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, all these different markets that are certainly popping up. You can always go back to real estate and kind of look at those historical returns, and and there you are, and eleven percent. You know, <laughs> some people might laugh at that, right? But that's a very decent return historically speaking. And I also throw in that it's secured by the most liquid real estate class in the country, SFR, single family homes is the largest asset class in the country. So you are earning 11.7% returns historically, but from a risk adjusted basis, when you consider the collateral and the, just the high quality collateral that tends to appreciate that's underneath it, it's a compelling return. You know, we are talking returns that are in excess of the S&P 500, which is, you know, an equity index. And you're also backed by a, a very liquid asset. So yes, it goes through cycles and there could be times when the value is down, but if you have staying power in it, it's a very secured asset. So, you know, think about risk adjusted returns and kind of the old finance model. And we just think it's a superior investment um, when you factor that quality of the collateral underlying those returns. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and the one thing the fractional space has has done, um, even though obviously real estate's always been there, is it's it's kind of opened your eyes to what all these other assets have historically returned. And it's not all just about putting your money into an index fund or, you know, even a savings account or anything like that. There's, you know, money to be made in these other markets, other other assets. And like you said, and and, and strong markets. I mean, real estate is, like you said, thousands of years old, right? People have been investing in, in buildings since 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 the first building was built, I imagine. You have an interesting thing here. You have a, a home buying program that I wanted to talk about. And what really piqued my interest was you offer the homeowners, the original homeowners, to keep 10% interest in the home. Could you talk about that a bit? I mean, I, obviously, I, know, I would understand why you would want to buy a, a good home. Uh, why offer that 10%? Yeah, we have a lot of people that really believe in the model and the the aspect of you know shifting to more passive ownership. You know, I think 75% of the rental properties in, in this country today are owned by mom and pop landlords who own less than four rental properties. And I think what we're seeing is that more of them are thinking about, okay, what does the future of my ownership of these properties look like? And when they think about that, they're thinking more passive and, and less work. And so we're seeing a lot of people that want to you know, potentially bring those properties to arrive. And that's where we've been testing that home buying program and, and getting feedback. And the unique thing about Arrived is it's the only platform where you could you know, sell a home that you have and also continue to own shares in that home and have it continue to earn income for you and appreciate for you. And so I think it's just such a unique aspect of, of our model since we're securitizing these homes that uh, for people who want to access more passive ownership, they can they can you know do so on arrived. They can get some liquidity. They can get passive ownership and and ultimately you know retain a stake over time. Yeah, I mean I think I think that's amazing. I think that. It would give a homeowner, most homeowners, a more compelling reason to sell to you, right? As opposed to somebody who, I, I don't know if they would take more money off the top or whatever, but it allows you to keep some skin in the game. And the thing is, right, with a home, a lot of times you you put money into a home, you put you know your hard earned cash into it to improve it, to improve your your quality of life as things change, as your family changes, and it's always that idea, right, of you know still maintaining ownership in in an original home, your first home bought. I don't know, it's pretty powerful to me. I think what's also interesting about that program is that there's some information that is embedded into that from our perspective. If there was a homeowner and they were trying to sell their asset and they knew that it was trouble, that it wasn't good, that it's, um, it's, it's a lemon <laughs> of a home where there's a lot of expenses, I'm not sure that they'd want to actually retain a percentage of that. If they want to retain that percentage, it kind of signals to me that there's some good things about this home that they've experienced over the years that they have some inside information that I'm not necessarily privy to, but I can kind of extrapolate that if they want to keep it um, and maybe they need the cash for some other purpose, I generally feel good about buying that, especially when they have that skin in the game as you're referring to. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, someone who's just going to take the money and, and run, I mean, not that not that people are doing that, but there's so many stories you hear about people that sold a home to somebody else, didn't disclose something, and uh, and the homeowner is paying thousands of dollars to remedy it. And it's 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 crazy. You wouldn't want to retain any of that um, if that was the case. Uh, on, on the flip side, right, uh, the tenants, the renters, and I'm just curious, I would imagine that if there was like a, a, a rent-to-buy program, that a rent-to-buy program would maybe attract, quote unquote, I don't know if this is the right word, but better renters, right? Renters that maybe one day are interested in buying the home. And then gives you like a, a built-in um, kind of market right there where the homeowner can buy, the renter can buy the home in seven years, five to seven years at the appreciated amount. Uh, is that something that maybe that that has that can be possible? Um, is that something that that seems feasible? Or I'm, I'm just throwing ideas out there. I think in some ways this is this is tied to the the earlier conversation we were having about mobility and, and people moving around more. And the reality is is because now you can move to different areas of the country without even changing your job a lot of times that there is more you know flexibility and mobility just in general in people's lives and the reason why i mentioned that is because we see a lot of renters in general seeing arrived as a way to invest and build equity in multiple properties um, not just the home they're living in because it might be that you know they want to start building home equity or property ownership but they don't necessarily want to own the home they're living in right now because maybe they're going to be somewhere else in a couple of years or their family size is going to be different a few years down the road or they just aren't ready to 
you know, settle into a home that they want to own for the very long term. And I think that's going to continue to be the case more and more where, you know, people are waiting for, for longer in their life to, to potentially buy that home that they're going to, you know, really settle into and, and really enjoy some of that greater flexibility to, to move to different areas or let the size of home and region of the home uh, just within their city kind of grow with their needs. And, and you know, combining renting with you know, a, a product like Arrive where you can own equity in lots of properties and diversify, I think really is, you know, helps enable that in many ways. And so that's one of the interesting things that I think we're seeing. Um, we, you know, certainly there is that case of potentially renters and tenants in these properties may want to buy these individual homes as well. And it's, you know, we we really want to create a great experience for every renter and tenant that that lives in an arrived property. Absolutely. And so we really think about that a lot. But I think the the interesting thing in general is is just what does splitting apart the ownership of property from where you're living, you know, do and and how might we help people build ownership of property much earlier in their life than they might otherwise have done if they were trying to buy the home they're currently living in? It, it can also act as you can conceptualize a renter buying equity in arrived homes as a hedge against rent prices themselves. So if they want the flexibility to change different cities, change jobs, circumstances change, you're effectively able to lock in your rate because as you invest in other rental homes, your upside is growing, you know, as rents go up. So maybe your rent is going up too in the area that you live, but you also have this side investment that's providing greater cash flow. So, you know, it can act almost as a a derivative market for yourself to hedge your own rents that you're paying by investing on the side um, and lock in that real rate of rent that you are paying. That is really interesting. Um, are, are renters aware that that uh, you know that they're living in a home that's being that's being fractionalized? And <laughs> does that even uh, I don't know how that would play in it, but I, I would imagine that they would Im- immediately be interested in that financial model and just kind of interested to learn more about it, right? Yeah, I think that there are some potential challenges, at least in messaging early on, you know, before we have a really solid message that's, you know, that we'd want to show everything behind the curtains that this is a fractionalized investment, you know, to the extent that there may be multiple owners of a, of a property may give some people some discomfort, you know, just kind of throwing ideas out there. But at the same time, uh, we have definitely gotten tenants who are interested in investing in their own home. So some people are, you know, not bothered at, by it at all. So I think that, you know, whoever the end owner is, um, is not going to be a long term concern. But I, currently, we're not actively promoting that, you know, you live in a fractionalized investment. I'm, I'm not sure that there's a ton of upside. But to the extent that, you know, they're not precluded from investing in their own home or any of the other homes. So it's just a part of the business that we're continuing to evaluate, but haven't quite made the leap to fully kind of join the investors and the tenants uh, in, in a cohesive program quite yet. Yeah. And I think part of that is, you know, we've partnered with these property managers that are, are managing um, and supporting those relationships with the tenants local in, in each city. And, and so they've really facilitated a, a big part of that relationship. And we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we, you know, best support that? As Cameron mentioned, we we have tenants that are investing in their own homes and investing in other properties on the platform, but still figuring out, you know, what's the right way to to approach that. And I really do appreciate you guys saying that. I mean, that's that's uh, you know, guys being transparent, but and and you've built that relationship, you know, on the ground where, you know, the homeowner doesn't, you know, to what 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 is the benefit, right? I kind of want to just wrap it up, you know, in a in a couple of minutes. Yeah, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, Ryan. I did want to mention again. I was talking to to Ryan uh, Cameron about me enjoying the names of the homes. So, like Ryan had mentioned before, you go on the site and you kind of have like this uh, a Zillow layout, right? You get to choose from the different homes, and um, you know, I, I came upon the name of uh, the McLovin, and uh, how each property has its name, and uh, I just I just kind of I love that. I was like immediately, I was like the McLovin. I would love to live in that home. It's actually a beautiful home in Denver. Yeah, that's the. I think the naming of the homes has been you know really a fun process, uh, and a lot of the homes are are named based on the street name. And I think really it was an effort to 
um, just come up with something unique that made it easier to talk about which homes you were investing in and, and kind of reflect back on that. We got to a point as we started to get more and more names and, and sometimes the street names weren't working as names, or sometimes we might have a, a street name that you know another home is already part of as our portfolio got larger. And so we started offering to you know our clients, our investors to, to name properties. Uh, and so the McLovin was, was named by by one of our investors, uh, Hadi, and we weren't sure quite what to expect when when you know he uh, picked that name. But yeah, we we've gotten a ton of positive feedback just on. I think it's it's fun to be able to you know have that uh, as a as a kind of something to share and say you know here's the property that I own. I own shares in the McLovin or the Cupcake, and it's an easier way than trying to remember you know, the property address or, or something like that when when you're talking to people about which properties you're you're investing in on arrived and, and kind of sharing the decisions that you're making. I think it's also really demonstrative of who we are as a company to connect our investors with the assets that they own. One of the common criticisms of REITs and, and larger pools that we're hearing from our own investors is that they just don't know what's underneath that security. So they buy a share of a fund and who knows what's in it. They're called blind pools and they're blind for a reason because you don't know what's in it. So our approach has been the polar opposite. You know, the model inherently is you buy one property, you know, at a time. And, you know, there may be flavors of this, different flavors going forward. But fundamentally, you know exactly which property you're buying. It has a name. And it's just very indicative of who we are as a company is that we want to be transparent about the asset. We're working on platforms to bring more of the data to the investor. So when rent is paid, we want to show you that, you know, the money came in. When there are expenses, we want to tell you exactly what's going on and how we're addressing it. So it's a very personalized experience. And I think the evolution of the company going forward is going to keep doubling down on that idea that people want to know what they're buying. And that's who we are fundamentally as a company is to, to bridge that gap. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, you're right about that. You know, going back to the names, I guess that that personalizes a little bit. You know, you're you're really in there, and and you know, just having the pictures of the homes on the website, you you know what's going on there. Kind of fun question to kind of uh, get your take on it. Are there any homes that that you guys have have acquired that were just like this was this was a really great get? You know, a favorite home that you might have on the website in your in your funds that you're just like proud of getting. So from an economic point of view, the the home that I uh, am most proud of is a home located in Columbia, South Carolina. As as we all know, the real estate markets are just really expensive today. So uh, we bought a new home. It was a new build in pretty close to the city center of Columbia. So it was kind of a tear down of an older lot and they built it back up. It was $210,000 as a new home and we got um, $1800 of rent on it. So you know, needless to say, I definitely bought some shares of that myself, as you won't really find that in any major metropolitan area, those types of economics. So I was particularly proud of that one. But, you know, all of our homes are really beautiful. And I'm very thankful that I get to look at pretty homes all day when when we're looking to invest as opposed to teardowns and rehabs that, you know, need a lot of loving. So I think there's going to be a lot of fun homes to come because we're also actively looking for short-term rental investments. Uh, so vacation homes, Airbnbs, um, and we're still working on that product. So it's, it's still yet to come. But when you open yourself up to that world, there's some pretty cool stuff out there. Like we've seen luxury tree houses, yurts, you know, those Mongolian circular tents that are really super nice kind of out in the middle of a forest. So there's some really fun stuff that we're going to you know start getting into. And we'll be really excited about those assets. And they'll definitely have some fun names too. Yeah, those micro builds. Um, I've seen them. I mean, uh, they're like I don't know, two, three hundred square foot little little things, but people love them because you know that they're, they're out there. They're, they're typically by the woods, but they're like they're small, but they're they're comfortable. And um, I know they're big hits. Ryan, anything that sticks out in your mind? I know that you guys started in, in Arkansas. You've expanded. Just anything that you're you're kind of proud about? You know, something you've achieved, or or a home that you bought, or just the pace that you guys are growing. Yeah. Well, I think that the the Northwest Arkansas. Uh, market. I, I grew up in Arkansas, so obviously you know believe in that market a lot, and it's seen incredible growth. Um, it's it's right around the top 100 in terms of MSAs uh, in Northwest Arkansas, and you know, has seen great population growth uh, decade over decade. So really hit the sweet spot of kind of what we're looking for, and provides those great balanced, you know, dividend yields and and appreciation. 
potential that we really look for. Um, so you know, certainly a, a sweet uh, soft spot for for properties there. But also one of the properties, uh, the basil, is named after uh, my dog, and so I'd, I'd have to I have to call out uh, that one as, as one that you know. Uh, yeah, fun to fun to see, and and we did a, a fun um, email newsletter just showing the the returns that the property had been generating, and I got a bunch of uh, texts and emails from from folks about that one. But yeah, in general, I think you know the thing that I'm most proud of and have been excited about is just you know the fact that we've been able to make so many properties now available to you know, thousands of investors, and they're now acc- accessing properties in you know, over 15 markets. And I think it's just been really rewarding to to see you know what that has meant for people, and you know that they they agree with you know our view of of investing in, in rental properties, and and it feels like we've we've created value for them and in, in making this experience so much easier. Uh, you know, a process of investing and owning a home that's just so complex when you when you do it on your own, and and it seems like. Um, yeah, we've we've really been able to to simplify that process and and you know makes folks' lives easier uh, in investing in properties and and allowing them to you know build these portfolios. Yeah, I I gotta say that you know it's an advancement. I mean, it's it's kind of um what what's happening is we're really opening up markets to to be able to you know get these returns that were only accessible if you had you know a certain amount of capital and then and then even more capital on top of that because of of in terms of re- rental properties you know, the surprises that could come out. Um, so if you're telling somebody, you know, that they could invest a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars and and you know what, get eleven percent back, that's an avenue that they never had before. It, it really is like a an investment, an investing advancement that that's kind of just brought it up. And and what better way to do it than with uh, real estate? This was great, guys. I mean, I, I'm wondering if there's anything else that you know that I didn't cover or that you guys felt like you guys wanted to cover. I know that you guys talked about your your website, arrivedhomes.com. How else can people get in touch with you? How else can they can they interact with the company or with you know through social media? Yeah, I think that's the best way to to follow us is arrivedhomes.com or you know on social media we're at arrived homes on on most uh, social media networks. And yeah, if you come to our website, you can reach out anytime. You can set up a call with our team. You could set up a call with Cameron as well, or you might get someone else from our team. But yeah, we we love to chat with folks who are interested in investing in in rental properties, and we also have tried to you know, work really hard at making investing in property simple. So I think you'll find that it's the easiest real estate transaction you've ever been a part of for anyone who's you know, purchased property before and would love for people to to give it a look and see if it's a good fit for for them. Cameron, is there anything maybe that you might want to add that we didn't touch? I mean, I know we talked about a lot. No, you know, definitely, as Ryan said, please reach out if you have any questions. We'd be really excited to prove that... Um, you know, we as a business really provide great value. So certainly come and check out the investment offerings. We are aggressively expanding into many new markets. So, you know, if we're not in your market yet and you want to invest in, you know, have the best way to invest in your own market, let us know. We are very open to feedback and often take our investor feedback, you know, very seriously where we're we're looking into the places where they're saying is hot. And I think that uh, having a that collaborative relationship with our you know potential investors is also something that really good that we do we're listening in on calls all the time and we do super unscalable things in the sense that you know we're we're all really busy, busy trying to build this business but every day everybody's taking a lot of investor calls you know we're not uh, we don't have it outsourced to any you know call center where we're just kind of like oh this is an administrative nuisance it's more like you know we're listening to calls and listening to our investors um, every day. So please reach out to us because your feedback is the most valuable thing um, for our growth right now. That's awesome. Well, Cameron, uh, Ryan, thank you guys so much for for being on here tonight. Very valuable information and best of luck to you guys. I'm sure you guys are going to do uh, incredibly well. And, and hopefully we can we can talk in another couple months, six months, a year, who knows, and see where else you guys have expanded to. That would be great. Yeah, that'd be great. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ryan and Cameron. It's great to see experts in their field coming up with innovations that benefit the general public. Investing in real estate can be cost prohibitive and homes difficult to maintain. Arrived has a solution for that, opening up yet another pathway for regular investors to build wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, let others know about it. We find our guests so interesting and knowledgeable 
and I know others will too. Or leave a review or hit the follow button. Until next time, take care.